good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry for running on the late schedule and all. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here, and uh, thank you for taking the time to come and uh, celebrate and listen to the words and uh, honor my father, uh, Luther, Medicine Bird, Black Bear, White Eagle, and his life, his journeys. Uh, my name is Stephen White Eagle. Um, one of his sons, uh, we come from a town called Kingfisher, Oklahoma. My father, Luther, his giant name is uh, Mahana Vigus. It means medicine bird. He was born August 4th, 1945, to the parents of Daisy Marie Turtle and his father, James Black Bear White Eagle Sr. Uh, my father, he, uh, he became uh, active in his military life. At the age of 17, he had made the choice for himself, his family, to better his life and to take the option of going to explore the world and also to fight and defend the freedom for his country that he loved so much. He was in the military for about seven years. After the military, he got out. Um, like many other of our service people that went over to Vietnam, and of course they come back and they weren't welcomed back to America with open arms and they weren't you know, given the thanks that they were supposed to and all the dramatics that they went through over there. And my father, he suffered from that a little bit. So he took it upon himself instead of going to the, the doctors and he would go through the spiritual uh, path of our Cheyenne way and go through the healing process of that. And around 1976, 1977, he went to go see one of his grandfathers, Edward Red Hat the First. His Cheyenne name is Fan Man. At the time, he was the arrow keeper. He was also a holy man of what you would call a medicine man. <coughs> so he went to go see Edward Red Hat and ask him if he could help him in his journey of life to get over the distress, the strain. I guess now they call it PTSD. Back then they would call it shell shock. He would um, have these reoccurring dreams, you know, problems that those men and women faced that came back with the issues from the Vietnam War. And during this healing process, the spirits would come to him, help him in his journey of life, lift him up, make him feel better. And because of that, my father was healed through our healing ways through our medicine ways, through our Cheyenne Tatista ways. And because they healed him and blessed him so much, he decided to devote his life to learning all of our traditional ceremonial ways, our healing ways, so that we could carry him on for our future generations, so that he would have something to pass on to me and my family and to the generations to come. So, <clears throat> in 1982, my father made a vow to go through one of our most important holy ceremonies. We have our ceremonies every year, still to this day, in Sealing, Oklahoma. We have our traditional encampment for two weeks. And for the whole entire two weeks, we have our ceremonies that were given to us by our holy man, our prophet, uh, Mazzei of Sweet Medicine. A long time ago, he brought us our sacred objects. It's they are called our sacred arrows. And those arrows that he brought to us gave us our way of life, our healing ways, our protection, our blessings. And my father, in 1982, he made a vow to go through this ceremony to gain more knowledge, to gain more healing, <coughs> to gain more blessings in our way of life to better his life, my family's life, and also our Cheyenne people's life, to carry on our sacred ways so that these would never die out. We would always carry them on for future generations. In 1983, he went through the ceremony. He made uh, his vow. He completed his ceremony, and he became what is called a sacred, <clears throat> sacred arrow priest, an arrow man. It is one of the highest positions that you could have in our tribe. And he was a leader amongst this main ceremony for over 30, 35 years until he got later on in his life where his health was not
not doing so well, but he was still active in our ceremonial ways, not only in our Cheyenne way of life, but in other Native American cultures and other Native American tribes. He would do his best to travel around the world to spread the word of our healing ways, our protection ways. He would do his best to also preserve, protect our Native American sites, like the one that we're at here right now, our sacred mounds, our sacred burial places, any place that he was called to, he tried his best to go there and stand up and fight and make sure that the lands that they were protected, they were kept safe, and they were preserved for many future generations. He tried to fight the desecration sites that they would come in wanting to extract the bones or extract the different objects that they would find on the earth. He would tell them that this is not right. We're supposed to keep them here. This is their last resting place. They're not supposed to be disturbed. They're not supposed to be placed inside a museum or in somebody's private personal collection. Mahel, Omateo, God, they gave us our ways, and this is their last final resting place, and we would like to keep them and preserve them here. And my father, he did a lot of work all throughout the United States, mostly in Oklahoma, mostly in Tennessee, and Tennessee is where he made his permanent residence for about over 20 years. And in Tennessee, he took on a lot of cases out there to protect and preserve a lot of our burial and sacred ancient sites. A lot of them, we had successful wins. A lot of them, they weren't so successful, but he never stopped his fight. He tried to do it in the most peaceful, traditional, ceremonial manner that he could. He was also welcoming to other people's ways and respectful of them, especially the Mashika brothers and sisters here. Uh, not that long ago, recently, is whenever he came in contact with uh, Janice and Arthur and Eloy. And he seen the goodness that these people had, and he wanted to connect more with the Mashika people to let everybody else around the world know that we are not separated. We are all one people. The only thing that separated was just that line that they put in the southern border and in the northern border as well. He wanted to show that our ways were very strong. Our ways were very similar. They were a little bit different, but they had a lot of similarities. The way we prayed, the way we did our offerings and our directions, when we called upon the spirits, when we made our food offerings, our dances, our drums. Yes, they might look a little bit different, but they are all still the same. We all come from one, from Mahel, from God. And my father, uh, he had passed away April 14th, I'm sorry, August 14th, 2018. He just suffered a lot of, I guess you could say, um, medical problems from, mostly from going to Vietnam, um, going through that stress, also going through what they sprayed over there called Asian Orange, and he was diabetic as well. But he never strayed away from his traditional ceremonial ways. Uh, he used his medicines every day. Uh, he was a pipe carrier as well. And until the day that, uh, until the day that he passed away, he still made his offerings in the morning. He would get up early in the morning. Um, Even though my father, he fell ill later in his life, he still made his, his offerings daily. He still took his pipe and prayed. Early in the morning, I would get up. Before I would head to work, I would go and check on my father. Sometimes he would be awake before I would be awake. And I would hear him in there praying. It was kind of difficult for him to get outside like he would beforehand and make his offerings, but he would do it in his room that he had his altar in, his Dasmanali, uh, as the Meshigas would call it. And he had his sacred objects in this room. We had a room set aside for him. And 
He would take his pipe out. He would pray. He would make his water offerings. I would hear him in there speaking our language. He would often be talking to the spirits as well. Sometimes I'd get curious and I'd, out, I'd ask my dad, you know, who are you talking to? I thought he would be on the phone, but he would be talking to the spirits. And they would talk back to him as well, bring him things, bring him dreams, bring him visions. Um, to the last day that he passed away, um, he still kept to his true ways. He'd always remind me to always remember who you are, stay true to who you are. Do your best to treat others well. If you have traditional, ceremonial, spiritual ways, to always stick to them and remember them. Because our ancestors, they fought so hard and they did what they could to continue on our spiritual path, our traditional path, like we are here today. That's why we still have our dances, our songs, our drums, our pipes, our ceremony ways, because our ancestors did what they could in the past to bring us these things to keep them strong as well. Uh, my father, every time that he would go somewhere, he would bring uh, his medicine with it. He would burn it, offer a prayer to the spirits. He would let everybody take some of his medicine to smoke from it and brush yourselves off. When you do this, you know, you're receiving a healing for your body, your soul, your mind and your spirit, and as the smoke would go up into the air, you could also carry your prayers to Mahel Omatel. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming here, for listening to our words, for honoring my father, for help celebrating his life, and thank you so much for our Mashika brothers and sisters. Like I said later, they're going to do their dance, the Aguila Banca, their White Eagle dance. Um, in honor of my father, they also did the same dance at my father's wake ceremony to help his journey, to help his spirit get to where it was supposed to go. Um, so while Janice and Arthur, while they're doing their talking, I'm going to go ahead and light his medicine and go around the room. And if everybody would like, you can take some of this smoke, brush yourselves off with it. But before we do this, I would like to ask everybody in our Cheyenne ways, before we perform any kind of ceremony, we would touch the earth four times. If you're unable to touch the earth four times, you can make four motions toward the earth. And we would use Mother Earth to bless our bodies, to bless our heart, bless our soul, our mind, and our spirit. Because Mother Earth is so good that she provides everything that we need naturally for us every day. We also would touch her and say thank you for continuing on to bring us our plants, our foods, our medicines, everything that we use daily. Thank you for Ishi, Donatio, the sun, for providing, for providing us with the warmth, the heat, the light. Thank you for Daesh, Mesli, the moon, for giving us that energy, for giving us that healing powers at nighttime. And thank you for the Nestin Awards, the spirits, for always coming here, being, us, being around us, Providing us what we need, giving us our healing, our protection. So if I would ask everybody, if you could, please, if you're unable to, if you could make four motions or if you could touch the earth four times and use Mother Earth to brush yourself off. Thank you.
this morning, uh, this morning when I uh, when I woke up in the cabin or chalet or whatever they call it, uh, I sat up on the edge of my bed and I saw a large uh, white sphere of white light. I knew who that was. It's uh, the Lou White Eagle. And he's here with us now. I see him smiling and he's holding a pipe in his hand. So we'll go back, uh, go back a little bit. Uh, Lou and uh, Stefan and I live in the uh, same town, the uh, east of the uh, same area, east of Nashville. And I went over to his house uh, many times. I was uh, in August. Uh, I talked to him, and I was going over to his house. He was going to give me an eagle, uh, eagle feather that he got had the had the permit uh, from the wildlife service, and, and we were also going to discuss uh, making re uh, recordings and a video of him uh, giving some of the ancient uh, Cheyenne uh, sacred songs that he said that were being. Uh, being lost, so I got into my car and I uh, was uh, maybe a quarter of the way to his house when I received a call from Stefan. He said, uh, "He says uh, don't come, uh, don't come to the house." He said, "My father has had a heart attack. His heart's quit beating. The EMS is here and they're taking over, taking him to the hospital." And he said, it doesn't look good. So I uh, went, uh, went to my office and I laid down on the uh, altar, on the uh, table in front of my altar. And uh, I, was, uh, I was starting to cry. And I saw this big white, I saw this big white sphere of light about five feet in diameter appeared in front of me, and Lou White Eagle appeared to me, and he said, uh, thank, uh, thank you for all you've done. He says, don't worry, I'm in a good way. Uh, I've been suffering. He had an amputation. He had all kinds of terrible medical, pro uh, medical problems. He was suffering in severe pain, but he continued with his spiritual work and his work with the Cheyenne people and uh, Oklahoma and with the Mexica people, and as, as you know, Stefan's girlfriend is uh, 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 Leite, and so he be, uh, we began to work very closely with the Mexica or Aztec people. Uh, so, anyway, I'd like to tell you briefly a little story. Uh, we went over to uh, we went over to his house and made a. Uh, made a recording, and after smoking the uh, pipe and uh, so forth, he told us his story. At the time, he was living in Memphis, Tennessee, and he just uh, found out that uh, Memphis State University was planning on uh, doing an excavation uh, on what at that time was called DeSoto Mounds, which actually is in downtown Memphis, right by the bridge and right by the Mississippi River. So I said, this, uh, this must not happen. And as a friend, uh, Sonny, and a number of others uh, uh, gathered at the site, and uh, they were met with a great deal of opposition. And, uh, they had already staked out the burial area uh, with stakes, and he paid the uh, young uh, Indian children 25 cents each to go throw the uh, stakes in the river. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so then the archaeologist had a fit. They called the they called the police and they said, "We want these children arrested." And, uh, said, we aren't going to we aren't going to arrest a bunch of little uh, we aren't going to arrest the little children. And they put up a teepee on the site and they said, "You can't have the teepee." So the university complained and wanted the teepee. Uh, TP removed because there weren't supposed to be anything like that. And then they started a sacred fire. The archaeologists called the fire department uh -huh. and came roaring up with their truck. And so then they finally decided if the, somebody stayed with the fire all the time and they put 
rocks around it that could keep it going. Uh -huh. And anyway, they're still met with great, uh, great opposition and uh, all kinds of problems. And all of the native people camped out, camped out on the site and said prayers. And uh, in the meantime, they're meeting all kinds of opposition with the police and the uh, with others and with our wonderful government about why they're interfering with us. And then a miracle happened. Lou White Eagle uh, took a, a, a jar and he walked down to the river, to the Mississippi River. He waded into the river and he talked to the fish people. And he said, dear fish people, can you help me? Uh, I want you to dry up the river. And uh, so he took, took some water and then took it up to their sacred camp. And guess what happened? First time in known history, the Mississippi River went down, down, down. It got, got to a point where he could almost walk across the river. And uh, the barges could no longer... Uh, go up and down the river. So this is a very serious situation. So then the people from Memphis, uh, the government officials came to him and said, well, we really, we really aren't sure what you did or if you're using black magic or sorcery or what's going on. But we would like you to, uh, uh, we, one, we have decided there's going to be no excavation on the site. Yay! Yeah. Uh, two, the other thing they decided, uh, this was called the Soto Mounds. I remember the uh, first uh, uh, European white man in Tennessee was Hernan de Soto, and he actually went to this uh, mound and they found, they found uh, uh, Spanish uh, silver crucifixes and various other things, so they know he was there, and they said, well, we're, uh, you know, De Soto wasn't a really good man. He led the way for the European conquest. But anyway, so they said, we're going to rename the mound. We're going to rename it uh, Chickasaw Mound, which it is caused to this day. And another agreement is, we're going to clean this place up. It was, the restrooms are run down and broken and locked. There are weeds growing every place. This is a favorite place for drug uh, yeah. drug dealers and druggies. And uh, I said, we're going to clean it up. We're going to mow it. We're going to open the restrooms. We're going to have a guard. So, uh, and uh, we're going to keep the mounds uh, mowed down. So they, uh, uh, so they said, that's part of the agreement. So after all of this was done, uh, Lou... Uh, uh, Lou said, well, I've talked to the spirits, and they agree that all of this is acceptable. So I'm going to take the, uh, the jar of water back down to the river. So he walked down the bank of the river, and he waded into the river, and the river now was very, very low. And Memphis was just in total chaos, because the rivers are life. All of these hundreds of barges that go up and down the river every day. So he went and he talked to the uh, he talked to the fish people and to the great spirit to the spirits. And he said uh, 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 he said uh, please bring the waters back and he poured the water back in the river. And guess what happened? <laughs> the water came back within a couple of days barges were able to Go up and down the uh, go up and down the river. The excavation was stopped. This is still a sacred site, and if you go to uh, Memphis, it's uh, right by the right by the river, and there are beautiful mounds there. They're very tall. They've been renamed a Native American name, the Chickasaw Mounds. The place is kept in good condition. I don't think the people in Memphis want to go through this again and have the, have the river, <laughs> river go away. And this is an absolutely, absolutely true story. And uh, uh, I made a video of it. We lost some of the pictures, but guess what day I found it?
on them the day before we came back up here. So we're going to work on this and have it on the, uh, uh, have it make a YouTube uh, video out of it, a true story of what, uh, of a, uh, what some people, would, what most of us would consider to be a true miracle. I mean, who can dry up the river? Maybe uh, they did, the Israelites did when they crossed the river. <laughs> Red Sea, but it didn't get quite to that point. So, uh, great. Uh, one of the uh, names for the Great Spirit, which I think we all should remember and never forget, is that he's the great. The Great Spirit is a great mystery, yes. and the mystery we can never understand. The mystery nobody knows exactly uh, what's going on or what happens and all of this. It's all a great mystery, but it's all for, all for good. So uh, I have uh, quite, quite Eagle comes to me every, every few days in this big balls, and he said, uh, and ball of light, and he talks to me, and he says, all is, he says, Arthur, uh, all is well. I am in a beautiful place. Don't worry about me. I'm in a place, I was in a place of great pain and sorrow, and now I'm in a, in a beautiful place. I can't explain to you for exact where I am, because this is part of the great mystery, but I can tell you that I am, and if any of you saw this ball of light, which I see now, it's starting, oh my. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, Blue, white eagle, black bear, Nick and Todd he is here with us. And thank uh, Stefan, we love you. He's carrying on, he's carrying on his father's work. And uh, let's all, uh, do you have another song you could do? Another song for uh, uh, Lou. Lou White Eagle, one of the most amazing people I've ever, I've ever met. You know, somebody that loved everybody, and he firmly believed in the Red Road, the sacred circle where everybody is one. We're all facets in a beautiful, beautiful jewel. We're all important, regardless of what you know, we've been selected to do in this life. And uh, he was foremost in the continuing uh, Native American spirituality because the Red Road, the Native American spirituality on it, uh, is, is what's going to save the world. If, where we're all equal, where we're all one, where there are no borders, where there's no inferior immigrants, oh my God, there's no, uh, nobody that's inferior, we're all equal, we're all one. So that's the world that we're praying for and the world that is coming. So let your light shine. Fill yourself with light. As soon as enough light shine in the world, uh, darkness is going to disappear. And darkness is disappearing. And the ceremonies here were very important. These ceremonies reactivate the earth and bring light to the earth. And believe me, from what I've heard, Ohio could use a lot of light. <laughs> in the whole world. Anyway, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the White Eagle Black Bear for your life. And now I'm going to turn this over, turn the microphone after the song to uh, uh, Janice.